Well, I was. Oh, he started recording. I was worried my microphone wouldn't work, but it looks like it's working. It's working. No good. So she says, right. So only on that one, there's 67 acre plants there. In the and then once he Good to see you. Hello. Can you hear us? We can hear you. <laughs> Excellent. That's yeah. That's my cousin Babs. Babs, can you hear? No. Okay. Well, it's not. Hello, Jane. Gary, can you hear? Uh, yes, I can, Chris. Molly? Molly's not sitting there. She's here. She's here. Molly. Yes, I can hear. There. I am going to text her. Hold on. Could be your next. Jackie. Jackie had cataract surgery today. That's right. How did that go, Jackie? It went very well. Good. Very Good. well. <clears throat> Thanks to Beth taking me down and escorting me back. Hey, Beth. Hello. I think maybe I'm muted. I'm muted. Nope. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Babs, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Right. Great. Wonderful. All right. No. No, actually, um, both my parents and my sister are up in Michigan with her right now. So she's not able to, she's very busy right now. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. Thank you. Thank I've you. I've got uh, two minutes to seven. We'll give uh, we'll give folks that two minutes to waddle on in here, or stride on in here, or canter, or whatever you do. <laughs> Hopefully, nobody stumbles into the room, but if so we'll love them anyway. Um, <laughs> you know how to draw a crowd. Well, but nobody wanted to sit next to me, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the person that wanted okay. to save that one for the one. I see. <laughs> um, as we are having folks come into the room, both physically and virtually, um, I'm going to pass around the snack sign up again for our in person folks. Just there's a couple spots that are still empty. So if you have not yet signed up, um, if you would please go ahead and do that, and I'm not going to give you my pen because it'll get stolen. <laughs> if you, oh, you don't trust the Bible. All I'm saying is the pen disappeared last week, so here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it this way. Okay. Yes. That looks like some nicer I stole that one from over there, so it's okay. You borrowed. Um, borrowed. Borrowed, borrowed. And, and then, <laughs> excuse me, Denise. 
if um, and then if you are doing your your dollars or if you brought your 20 I know some people paid on Givelify I saw that come through and and whatnot so again this is for the church for all not not church for all people although we do get families from them the Christmas families that we do every year um, and I was going to ask um, uh, Jane and Beth and Denise if you all would um, take the lead on that again this year and possibly take somebody under your wing to train so that you're not always the ones doing it. Okay. I will help. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to pass this around if you have your dollars or your 20 for the whole time. You've already paid up. Don't worry. And then I'm also, if you did not bring a hard copy and you're in person, you did not bring a hard copy of the outline, I'm going to pass that around as well. So take one and pass it. For the for the the outline, not for the money. Well, you know, we're only on the first chapter, so we haven't gotten to the part that talks about not stealing yet. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, well, there's there's been an, a request to uh, begin our time together with uh, introductions again. Uh, this time, just a name will suffice, and uh, that way, then we can go ahead and dive in. Um, here real quick. So if you would just say your name and I'll start with you, Roger. Roger. And Curry. say it loudly so everybody can hear. Roger Curry. I'm the husband of Jane. And just your name. I'm right. Jane Curry. <laughs> Ed. Ed Eglin. Jerry. Rebecca. Carol Estelle. Bill. Dave. Aaron. Mary. Mary. Gary. I'm Denise. That's okay. Um, let's go around the Zoom. So we had Gary and Denise. Jackie. I'm Beth. Babs. Molly. And Molly. Wonderful. Okay. Marlon. Tom. And I'm Chris. Wait, no, you were here last week. <laughs> Oh, is it Tom or Harry? Tom. That's Tom. Tom. Yeah. He was sitting Harry. over there last week. Nope. Of course, you're Harry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought I had his name Harry. <laughs> well, good, good thing we went around and did introductions again. It's Tom, right? Tom, yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, All right. What was that trying to do? Oh, one. Here's the thing we took it. I'm going to start us off with a prayer. And this is a prayer from the, the Book of Common Prayer for Ordinary Radicals. Um, <laughs> but this is, this is an affirmation of faith. And uh, so I, I want to open our time with prayer. Lord, you have always given bread for the coming day. And though I am poor today, I believe. Lord, you have always given strength for the coming day. And though I am weak today, I believe. Lord, you have always given peace for the coming day, and though of anxious heart, today I believe. Lord, you have always kept me safe in trials, and now, tried as I am, today I believe. Lord, you have always marked the road for the coming day, and though it may be hidden, today I believe. Lord, you have always lightened this darkness of mine, and though the night is here, today I believe. Lord, you have always spoken when time was ripe, and though you be silent today, 
I believe. Oh God, bless this, our time together here as we look into your word and seek to discern what your spirit is speaking to your church. I pray that you would be our wisdom and our thoughts and our speech tonight and give us your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Well, let's go ahead and uh, just kind of dive right in here. Um, though I am leading the class, as I told Dave earlier, we are all teachers here and we are all students. So um, I really don't want to be the only one talking tonight. And I know that won't happen. <laughs> um, but please don't be afraid to, to speak up and, and speak what God is speaking to you. And we're all here to learn from each other. So. Um, so we're going to start, and I'll, I'll ask for somebody to read for us, beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Would somebody read that for us? Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God which is in Corinth. To those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place called upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Bill. This is the opening to Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, so... What, what do you notice about this opening? It's a lot more than a high. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine if Paul was texting the Corinthian church? Yeah. It, it That's changed, what I was thinking. It about. changed the spelling. <laughs> because texting does. I mean, you go to you hit send and you're like, well, I didn't type that. Because it changes what it thinks she meant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, who is Paul writing to? Who is it? Who's the letter addressed to? Well, to the to the believers, those who have been sanctified or that believe in Christ as their Savior. Um, I, I think it's interesting. Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and that he never really walked with Jesus in his mm -hmm. lifetime, but uh, ended up essentially being the 12th apostle. Right. Mm -hmm. I like that phrase you said, to be an emissary of mm -hmm. the Messiah. Mm -hmm. you know, they used to call um, the royal reps from a king they were called apostles, and uh, they used to say that they would send out an apostle to, to as, uh, a new mission. So I think it sort of stepped in line with that for Christ to be. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father. Powerful message right there mm -hmm. to the saints. Grace be to you. And peace from our Father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the letter, the, the convention, the letters of the day would be, you know, an, an opening, you know, the, the letter writer and then who it was to. But Paul includes this line, grace. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I thought jumped out to me personally was that I'm trying to recall in the four gospels, I don't recall this, so you might correct me, but what Paul delivers here twice, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he mentions it once in that format, and then in the other format, Jesus Christ, our Lord, I believe. Jesus Christ, yes, our Lord. Chris, I don't recall in the four gospels making reference to Christ as Lord. Am I wrong on that? I, I don't 
Thomas Thomas yeah. says, oh, "My Lord dead. and my God." You're right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, and I believe that Christ Himself at some point says, "Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, well, yeah, um, will." Uh, and so I think there are a, a few references right. to Christ as Lord. And uh, David says that, "My Lord," to he mentioned, "My Lord, the Lord." <laughs> The Lord, King David Lord. He mentions the Lord. Right. Well, Jesus was asked, you know, the Messiah, who's the Messiah, the son of, to the uh, Sanhedrin? Mm -hmm. Well, they couldn't answer it. And they said, well, he's the son of David. But David said, you know, my Lord, my Lord. Yeah, that discourse between them and, and the Sanhedrin couldn't come back with anything. Else. Yeah. If, if something that if my Lord, if, if the Lord is, I'd have to go look it up. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. who, is, who is this Sosthenes? Ah, who is Sosthenes? Mark what says, anybody? he's not a fellow apostle. Does anybody remember? He was Last head of the synagogue. Right. Uh -huh. Yes. What happened? Uh, well, he was beaten by the parishioners there in the in the synagogue. If you go to Acts chapter 18, um, which we read last week, and um, you'll see in uh, verse 17, the crowd, they then all of them seized Sosthenes, the official of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio, who was the proconsul at the time, paid no attention to any of these things. <clears throat> he was, uh, the, the Jews were complaining about um, the Christian community, the believers, and how they were blaspheming against God, and so on and so forth. And so as one of the uh, leaders in that community, they seized Sosthenes and beat him. Similar to how Paul also experienced beatings and persecution as he went along his missionary journeys in different cities. Wasn't it true that he was allowed, uh, Paul was allowed to speak in the synagogue? He spoke in the synagogue, yes. And it says in Acts that in Corinth, at least, he wasn't making any much headway. And that's mm -hmm. when he went to the house of Titus next door. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's go a little further, verses four through nine, finish the, the opening here of the letter. So would somebody read for us verses four through nine? I God, which is in you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind no argument. In no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you into the end, that you may be blameless in the way of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you. <laughs> so in addition to a greeting, I, Paul, to the church of Corinth, Paul also includes in his opening, he does this quite frequently throughout his letters, a prayer of thanksgiving for those to whom he is writing. How many times have you ever, and I say this having never done this, <laughs> included in the opening of a letter to somebody a prayer of thanksgiving for them? Hmm. I mean, not in the beginning, but not into the letter. Sure. Right? sounds like a good practice to take up. What, 
what does Paul mean by um, in every way you have been enriched in Christ Jesus in speech and knowledge of every kind so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift? Um, what I'm thinking about from the standpoint of scripture, and I think of Philippians, uh, enriched through the Lord Jesus Christ, which means Christ is at the center of their heart, which means they were born again, which means they're no longer citizens of the earth, but they're citizens of heaven, which then means they become ambassadors. And I'm thinking of both Philippians and 2 Corinthians, where it mentions when you are rich, you received a gift that's far beyond comprehension. But you have received not only the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, but you are now one in body and spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, which means your citizenship is no longer of this earth, it is of the heaven. Hmm. And if it is of the heaven, then you have become an ambassador of the Christ. Well put, David. <laughs> <laughs> Other I said I don't want to be the only one talking tonight. Other <laughs> comments? He is faithful. I mean, that speaks volumes. Um, all in the fellowship of the Son of Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Being faithful is the rock. I mean, that's the foundation. We can count on it. Mm. Um, what role does this letter written in um, relationship to Christ's crucifixion? Oh, about 22, 23 years um, after. So the people that actually were there had heard about it. Well, yes. I, I, in fact, uh, they've, they've heard about it from Paul. I can't answer that. <laughs> Perse uh, the widespread persecution came later. But that is your question. Yes. Yes. But that doesn't mean that they haven't seen Christians be treated poorly um it, in what we just read in acts chapter 18 you know sosthenes was beaten by mm -hmm. the jews but also that chapter showed how the official roman government was indifferent to christianity at that time because the governor didn't say one way or the other he didn't care that they beat sosthenes but he also didn't take action when the jews came to him to try to demand that he take action so at this time, there's no official persecution of Christians, but that doesn't mean that they aren't being mistreated by uh, the people in society around them. My understanding is that persecution existed where it wasn't the same level in all places. It depended on who was in charge. That's also true. And, and, and how much they disliked the followers of the way. And so in, in one town, their persecution may be severe in another town where another person was more on that, well, you know, if they're not going to bother me, I'm not going to bother them kind of attitude. It, it also depended on who was emperor. Yeah. Over the course of time, there were some emperors who were very, um, took a very hard stance toward Christians. Nero was one of them, um, and others who were uh, who backed off and and were less um, yeah. violent towards the Christians. 
thin by the quantity, the numbers of Christians. So if there was a smaller number, they probably didn't pay attention because they thought it would go away. But the more the multitude gathered, you know, from other things that you see even now in foreign countries and whatever, where they're persecuting Christians, if they have small churches at home, sometimes they leave them alone. But as that gathering gets larger, then the persecution gets more evil and, and more frequent. Yeah, certainly the, um, the relative power of the group would factor into it. Also, the ego of the person in charge, yeah. <laughs> because they had emperor worship. So if you know these people aren't bowing down to me, then I'm going to make them pay for it. But Paul, the main persecutor, what, like two years after Christ's crucifixion, pulling people out of the synagogues, killing them, stealing um, he was not by himself. No, and that was for religious reasons. And these are the leaders of the Jewish community who feel that people pro proclaiming Jesus to be God are blasphemers. That is why they are killing them. That's true. That uh, first Corinthians was written during the third missionary journey of Saul around 55. Mm -hmm. And we think it was written from Ephesus. So when he was in Ephesus, that he wrote back to Corinth. So what is it? What does it mean to be? I'm kind of focused on the body of the letters here, on the words here. So what? What do you to you? What does it mean to be sanctified in Christ Jesus? What does it mean to be called saints? And there are multiple answers here. So if David gives a really good answer, that doesn't mean that. Somebody else can't also give a really good answer. <laughs> and, and I'm not picking on you. You gave a really good answer. You gave a really good answer. Well, yeah. in, in the 10th chapter of John, verse 27, uh, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, in verse 28. And I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So to be sanctified, you're with Christ. No one can take you away. Not even Satan. Mm -hmm. Can you use the word atonement with sanctified? What did you say? I just thought they accepted Jesus as who he was and was born again. And so they accepted and knew they were believers with grace, which is unmerited favor. And that's how I. But I think that I think that sanctification is is after you believe, after you have accepted, you have become part of it. What mm -hmm. is the definition of sanctification? Of the word sanctify. Uh, I, like, I like to use the word faithful, holy, pure, uh, committed to God, and and. The, the word that he has provided and Roger's stepfather um, was a pastor and anytime we had a meal he always used that word when he prepared the food he said he would ask the Lord to sanctify the food that it will nourish us for you and your will and I just that just did everything for my heart I thought that was the most beautiful thought that he would want that for people around him. And he was truly as faithful a human Christian he had ever found. Sanctifying the food. Yeah. And then a lot. He said sanctified food will not harm you. That's not extreme. <laughs> Scripture <laughs> says we all become heirs. So, well, yeah, there's no yeah. hope. I mean, it, it, it's it's true. 
it's what it is. And um, I just think of sanctification as the actual <coughs> part of becoming part of it. Jesus, the high priest prayer before he made the journey to the cross that night, he said, sanctify them through thy truth, for thy word is thy truth. Mm -hmm. Later on, Paul wrote um, in Ephesians, and he said, sanctify them by the washing of the water of the word. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the sanctified process, my understanding, you do not become completely sanctified until we ascend to the Lord. Cleanse? We cleanse, cleanse yeah, washing of the water of the word. Sanctify them through thy truth for the washing of the water of thy word. So it's a process of cleansing. And my understanding is we won't become completely sanctified until we're absent from the body and present with mm. In the Corinthian Christians who criticized, he still called them sanctified, not because of their conduct, but because of their relationship to Christ. Mm -hmm. It's good. Very good. Uh, it's very good. good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So on whom does our sanctification depend? Grace. Grace. And being born again. Mm -hmm. Not that we merited it. But Not on us, mm -hmm. but on God alone. Right? right. right? right. Amen? Amen. Can I get an amen to that? Yep. All right. Hmm. For by grace are you saved to faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, but of any man to Mm-hmm. How do our lives change when we begin to live in Christ? How many of you grew up in the church, always been a Christian, don't remember a time when you weren't a Christian? How many had a conversion experience at some point in your life? I want to hear from you all. I'm with the first group, but I want to hear from you all. How has your life changed since having that conversion experience and beginning to live in Christ? I grew up in the church. It was the Roman Catholic Church. And thought I was just had a conversion experience when I was in my early adult years and I realized that there's a more for there is more of a metaphysical relationship with the board. It wasn't about just following rules and adhering to this to a certain doctrine. It was a it was it's a little bit the metaphysical thing and you could feel it and I I'm going to pause it right here. Can the folks on Zoom hear okay? No. no. Can I ask everyone in the room to just speak up? Just raise your voice a decibel for the mm -hmm. folks on Zoom. Thank you. Other, uh, for those who maybe didn't consider themselves in Christ and then at some point in their life started living in Christ. How, so how did your life, how was it enriched? How did it change? How might you say? I sang Christmas carols in a totally different way at the age of 36 when that happened to me. Mm -hmm. I had been in the church all my life, but at that point it was the most exciting thing to be in church and sing the Christmas carols, words that meant something to me before, but nothing like after I was saved. It, it was a joy to behold. 
I know you have a story. So. The reason I'm a little, um, a bit long. No, it's not that long, but it's a much. Mm. Okay. It's okay if you don't want to. I'll tell part of it. When I was went to beat, right? And you had retired. Uh, purpose driven. Short purpose driven life. And I saw him on the Tonight Show, I think it was. And I said, David, we need to get this book and we need to read Purpose Driven Life. So one day, it was in the fall, I left to go teach. David had retired and he had gotten dressed to go to the Y to work out. My daily routine it was to go work out. But for some reason, on the TV was channel. I turned it on, that which I have never done. I had my gym clothes on. When Karen would leave, I would go to the Y. So I'm walking out the door. By the way, I have bought this by the way. Like a month before. Why? I bought it because of purpose driven life. Uh, we get we get a purpose driven life over 40 days. It was a 40 day requirement. You read a chapter a day, purpose driven life. Um, and after we had finished Purpose Driven Life, I found myself reading it three times. Uh, and then uh, purchased this King James Bible, which ironic is we already had three King, King, King James Bible. Bibles in the house. <clears throat> uh, and I tried to read it in, in, our, in our family room, in the, the bookcase over here, land. Tried to read it, and I got through part of Genesis. Put it down. I couldn't get motivated. I couldn't push my way through. And then Karen uh, left for school. I always followed her to go to the YMCA to work out. And the TV was on. For some reason, it was on the channel. We, we don't know how it got there. I turned the TV on, which I had never done. And, and it went to Channel 51 or something? It went to a public television station. Okay. There yes. was and Les Feldy, who uh, the Bible, Oklahoma farmer, who said, I'm a Sunday school teacher. He said, I'm not ordained as a pastor. And I remember Hebrews chapter one, verse one. Where he started. And as soon as the lesson was over, David went to his knees, didn't he? Uh, three days later. Three days later. And that <laughs> changed everything. And Absolutely that third, everything. In that third day, last day, he said, um, it's been a long time since you have gone to First Corinthians chapter 15, Paul's gospel. So if you've never heard Les Feldick, who's 97 and it's just all dates, and we've been to see him in person four or five times, and it changed our lives. I mean, our TV is broken. Yeah. Our TV is broken, so we can't do his tape for three, two more weeks. So we and we're missing it because every morning we do let tell it. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> we knew you were <laughs> mm. very far. His message. His message. Mm -hmm. His message. Not necessarily a powerful speaker. He just said, I'm a message. That's the Oklahoma, small little town, getting it. Oklahoma. He teaches six nights a week. Yeah, six nights a week. Goes to different towns. Oklahoma City and that type of thing. And uh, he, he transformed both of our lives. Right. He transformed both of us. So much that our son now calls him Deacon Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I, do that. I apologize, but it's he has uh, the most for everything. <laughs> I'm beginning to think this room isn't big enough for your junk. I have to take it back. Gary, I just want to let you know we, we can hear everything going on in your room. <laughs> you can. Okay, I better mute it then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Well, the Corinthians, Paul says, have been enriched in every way, in every way, after having been called into faith in Christ Jesus. And so I, I just, I feel sometimes that I forget or don't realize the ways that my life has been enriched because I can't remember a time I didn't believe in Jesus. And so it's encouraging for me to hear some of those stories of folks who have been through a conversion experience um, because I don't, I don't remember life without Jesus. Um, and I'll tell you, when, if this is not my story, but um, in college, I had a campus minister um, and his wife who were atheists. Um, back in their young, not at when they were my oh, kids, minister, back when they were in their 20s, yeah. and they um, got invited by a couple from a church, one of their friends, to a Bible study, and they didn't really care about it, but they went, and they started doing this Bible study, and um, my campus minister, AJ, started to um, really struggle with how he had these strong convictions as an atheist, but was being encountered in the Bible. Um, and so he tells a story about how he was doing some electrical work one day. Um, and he was doing this electrical work and he was really kind of having, he was in on his own in this room and having it out with God. Like, do you really want me to believe in you? Like, are you really there? And, you know, it's, and so I can't remember the whole story, but it came to a point where he said, if you're really there, give me some kind of sign. You got that. <laughs> he got 40 volts of electricity <laughs> zapped through his body. And uh, he's been a believer ever since. Um, <laughs> but what's really interesting to me is that his wife, was one of those um, big shot Wall Street, big money kind of people. And, uh, and so she was a stockbroker, right? And after they started going to church and converted and became Christians, she realized that she couldn't stand the people she worked with and she could not take the environment that environment that was wealth 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 money 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 climb the ladder get to the top and she actually quit her high paying job in order to be a stay at home mom that's not saying that all women need to be stay at home moms but that is what she decided to do and AJ became a campus minister, and they lived in a very modest little house that every Friday night was packed to overflowing with poor, hungry college students, hungry in both senses of the word. And uh, they made such a difference on all of our lives. I would not be here tonight with you if it was not for AJ and mm -hmm. Susan. Wow. And... I can tell you that their lives were enriched even though they became poor because of the gospel. It's David and I, when we talk about David's experience, David grew up Lutheran. Mm -hmm. He was very involved in his church as a child, the older boy, everything. I mean, we grew up with Reverend Hurd, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. we did. And, um, but it's how it, the whole experience changed. It wasn't boring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it well, just changed not everything. Boring. You went through boring. <clears throat> no. Mm -hmm. Can I share my experience? Sure. Okay. Make it loud for me. Uh, yes, uh, very speak up. <laughs> Jane and I, we've always been blessed. I mean, we just absolutely, we can tell you story after story after story. I'm a country hit. She's a city girl. <laughs> we went to college. We should it's never so have met. I mean, my story is here at this church. Now, you may think this is not necessarily 
his story, but it is to me. Having been blessed all these years, one Sunday morning, Debbie Holder stood up in front of the church and she gave a sermon on tithing. And she said, give something. I don't care what you give. Next time you're asked to give, give more, increase it. I saw her at um, Bob and Phyllis Sleeps. Yes, yeah. 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 And I related that st story to her and she said, you know, absolutely. But our lives have been so blessed, tired. And now we see the rewards. We see God. Yes, we've been taken for granted and we realize we've been blessed, blessed, blessed beyond. We should never have met. <laughs> you're you're going to need to elaborate on that one. We've seen that story many times. I guess nobody knew, but but the story of tithing. Mm -hmm. I just can't tell you the accolades. Eugene uh, McGee, he had a, out in Cal Southern California, he had a mission. And this goes back, I used to listen to him on 88.1, driving back and forth to work. He said, you cannot outgive God. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I'll tell you, our lives have just been so just, it comes out of nowhere. Yeah. Yes. I know. Yes. I've been there. Yeah. And I'll tell you a quick story also. We're flying back from Washington State, and there's Buddy on the on the airline. Buddy. He is a buddy of ours. He's from the South. Two hours. He buddy him. told us his life about how God had absolutely just gave to him, gave to him, gave to him. And it was just, if it's Glorious moment. It's just incredible. That's your thing. Thank you, Robert. I want to read to you what um, this commentator says. If you're interested, this is uh, J. Paul Sampley is the name. Um, what he says here on these verses. Um, because believers are totally dependent on God's transforming grace for their new life in Christ, their basic response must be one of thankfulness to God. Paul expects thankfulness to God from all persons, and here he himself models it. Paul's relationship to other believers and his thankfulness to God for them is, not, is based not on whether he likes them or on whether they view issues in the world the same way but on the simple and profound fact that God's grace is active in them and in him. Our modern Christian community is founded on God's grace given to all, not on whether we are socially compatible and not on whether we take the same political views. So the Christian community Consist of those in whom God's grace is active and transforming. In verse 7 there, it says, so that you are not lacking in any gift, wait, uh, uh, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you to the end. Mm -hmm. The... the, the the team who will stand up and say, I know that person. And that's the gift. Mm -hmm. That's the gift. Mm -hmm. One of the things I thought about when Bill read that was that my understanding, Paul had written, he had, my understanding, the first letter he wrote was the book of Galatians. Um, in 49 BC. I, I believe it's Thessalonians. Well, I, it, yes. Then I was going to say first Thessalonians. Yes. So I think Galatians I is second. But yeah. Reverse. Yeah. But when Bill read that, the thing that I thought about the first letter, Thessalonians, um, chapter four speaks of the rapture and the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
And it just seems as though he's laying that out again here that you may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So it seems like he's weaving that into that previous message of the rapture of the church. He believed that, that was going to happen in his lifetime. You're right. He did. He did. Uh, he, did. Uh, he did. He did think it was coming in his lifetime. Yeah. Hey, but you see what he's 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 calling them away from all their differences and into their similarity, their unity, which is in Christ. And so that's going to that's going to transition us into our next the next section um Paul's appeal to them. And so uh, would somebody read verses 10 through 17 for us? Now I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, agree with each other and don't be divided into rival groups. Instead, be restored with the same mind and the same purpose. My brothers and sisters, Chloe's people gave me some information about you, that you're fighting with each other. What I mean is this, that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? Thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that nobody can say that you were baptized in my name. Oh, I baptized the house of Stephanus too. Otherwise, I don't know if I baptized anyone else. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And Christ didn't send me to preach the good news with clever words so that Christ's cross won't be emptied of its meaning. Thank you, Carol. What translation is that? Is that it's the um, CEB, mm. which is the Common English Bible. What, so what is Paul's ask? Why is he writing the letter? For unity. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's looking for unity amongst the members of the congregation. He's, you know, he understands that if they keep fighting and rebelling, they won't be together. Mm -hmm. That Christ will be forgotten because their all their thoughts and their needs and their aspirations will take over from what they should be doing with worshiping God. And we've never known of a church in modern day to have these folks. Oh. <laughs> well, I, remember, I remember one time in this church that we had an issue with the roof leaking in the sanctuary. Remember mm -hmm. that? No. And oh, people just stood there. Oh, we can't do this, or that's going to cost that, or blah, blah, blah. And the division started, and the team started lining up. And I said, people, the roof's leaking. We got to fix it. Oh, it, it was crazy. It was ridiculous. But we did that when we were on the team to add on to the church. Mm -hmm. And I remember in a meeting one night with two men directly across from each other, beyond ugly. Mm -hmm. And it got settled. And somebody said, but isn't this about God's house? And they said, okay, yeah, I guess it is. Your way, maybe we can make your way and my way work together. Let's see what mm -hmm. we can do. But it was somebody saying, but isn't this about God's house? Mm -hmm. And it was, it was interesting. D.L. Moody, who was head of the Moody Church in Chicago, mm -hmm. said that when there's so much division in the group, the Holy Spirit will not. Mm. No. Mm. Mm. Well, it's probably because he can't stand to be around the people yeah. when they're yeah. fighting and arguing. Or there's no room for him. Right. Well, that's that's it. Who's showing up? I will say I have never known a church that did not have petty infighting issues at some point. <laughs> because we're human, and you know, it started in the Garden of Eden, and here we are. I mean, we all we all were given our own thoughts and our own ways, and it's sometimes hard to compromise. And People we're selfish. And we're selfish. And uh, what do you think that Paul means 
by be united in the same mind and the same purpose. And I have some questions here on the outline. I want you to look at those. That mean we all have to share the same hobbies, same, oh, days, yeah. same opinions. What about same politics? No. I know a world if we all want. <laughs> <laughs> so well in the first place politics shouldn't even enter the church doors shouldn't that no. should be shouldn't left out okay. in my in my uh in the disciples tradition we have saying in essentials unity and non-essentials love and i said i might rework that to say um unity in christ in all else love what what do you first off would you agree with those phrases and it's okay if not and second what do, what would that mean to you all all all, all in love uh, john the mm. apostle john uh, was an example of god's love uh, and christ loved him because John loved Christ so much. I believe he was the only one of the disciples that was at Calvary when Christ hung on the cross. Um, <clears throat> it seems as though when, when Christ gave up his life as a son of God, he was rich yet he became poor so that through his poverty we might have joint heirs in Christ heirs with God, that he gave up his life on that cross so that he would live as an example of God's love to the world. And all he's ever asked from any of us is the great commandment. Mm -hmm. And that great commandment is obviously, first and foremost, to love the Lord thy God mm -hmm. with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. But then he said, and identical to that is the love of your neighbor. And it seems as though you cannot have the mind of Christ if you can't accept the grace of God and reveal that love mm -hmm. to your neighbor. Each and every one of us are a member of the body of Christ. And if we can't as a body, Reveal that love to each other as Christ revealed it to all of us. And there's something missing. There's something missing. And I believe what's missing is one of the worst things that any of us can hang on, and that is pride. Mm. Hmm. Karen is touching my leg, and I think it might mean I need to touch You are. Dave, you have hit on the heart of the issue here, though, because this goes back to last week when we talked about the culture of that day and how it was all about where you oh, yeah. are on yep. the right. And so what is going on in this church is that they have not left that part of their world behind. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you. <laughs> and, and, and if anybody on Zoom wishes to jump in, please go ahead. I, I don't want you to feel like you're being left out. You are present here in this room with us and you are full participants. So go, feel free if you have something you wanna to say to just go ahead. Well, uh, having been in Corinth, Bill and I were there a few years ago and my takeaway of Corinth was it was a den of iniquity. Mm. I mean, oh, yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was a city between two ports. Mm -hmm. And sailors would get off the ship over here. And by the time they got over here, they were broke. They, were broke. Mm -hmm. they would be paid before they got off the ship. By the time they got over here, they were broke because there was so much stuff in between. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Prostitution going on. Uh, prostitutes dressing in what we would call wet t-shirt contest. They would get, they would go down to the uh, to the to the city uh, fountain and get wet. They get jugs of water and then they would slop water all over them and their tunic would become transparent 
and on the bottom of their sandals written in Greek was follow me. <laughs> so when they made footprints in the dirt or the road and, and oh, it was something else. It was a, and that was to lead them in up to where the as well as were. the brothels were, gambling yes. and all kinds of other debauchery. <laughs> yeah. it it was, down the main sounds street. like brothels. Now we, we yeah. saw <laughs> where Paul preached there. And uh, Jamie, Jamie, what was the last name? Souls, Curtis, the Curtis Souls, that was uh, from uh, uh, Perkins Theological mm -hmm. Seminary. Mm -hmm. Jamie Clark Souls, that was with us, was on the ship and, and led all of our studies on the ship, preached up there to us. And so you've got a picture of what it was like to have Paul up there on that hillside. And it was a very small little hill. But the rest of that city was just an awful place to be. And for these people to keep their faith with all that going on around them probably was very difficult. So Paul probably knew exactly what was going on in Corinth. And for him to try to keep these people in line couldn't have been easy. For them to try and, try and keep their faith couldn't have been easy because I'm sure everybody was pulling at them. If, if you grew up in a area where you were used to that kind of thing happening all around you and then somebody <clears throat> comes in and starts preaching a whole new religion that you've never heard before, I think we would all have a difficult time trying to give up what we knew to understand what this man was saying. I know when he preached on Mars Hill and he was talking to the Athenians and he, and he almost had him until he started talking about the resurrection of Christ. And then a lot of them went away and said, ah, wait a minute, this guy's getting a little too far out. But they were interested in what he had to say. But um, so I think I think you can understand the turmoil that people were in. You know, how do we do this? What do we have to do here? It was a learning process. What was you know, giving up process. You know, yeah. I mean, they they had so much wealth. Oh yeah. And status. Mm -hmm. Well, and different gods and different idols. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden you pack all that up and that's all you've known your whole life. And it would pack it up and stick it away because here's something new. I think that was also difficult. Like you were talking, sure. there were the hierarchies. Yeah. The higher you were on the ladder, the harder it was to tip you off and for you to, mm -hmm. to, to come down to this point. So it doesn't start with small home churches. Is that like how it started? Mm -hmm. and yes. small, yeah, mm -hmm. home churches. Mm -hmm. um, I think this this church in Corinth is probably started at the house of Titus, which mm -hmm. is next to the synagogue. Um, one, one thing that I, I really want to bring into focus for all of us is that I think it can be easy for us as Christians to make Christianity about avoiding vice. Um, and Corinth was certainly a city of vice. It was, yes. it was Las Vegas of the ancient world. But they also... Um, had moral teachers in that society who taught against vice and taught in favor of virtue. The difference here, the difference in what was so difficult is what Paul says, the cross. The cross is scandal because you now we're not talking just about avoiding vice. Yes, there are you know, we want to do that. Yes, no, yes. But the scandal is that we worship a crucified God. We worship a God who's not up here, but has made himself here. Mm -hmm. That's the scandal. That is the difficulty. That is the issue. And that is what even today, so many Christians have trouble grasping because we're so busy trying to avoid vice that we've been completely forgotten where we're supposed to be on this ladder. Amen? Amen. 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 That's where we are. That's where we are in this ladder. And that's where mm -hmm. I want to bring us. We're at eight o'clock. Um, and so 
I'm envisioning that I've already gotten off my schedule in the first week. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to get through it. Chapter two is actually much shorter, so. Um, but uh, Rebecca and Jerry have brought our food for us. And um, before you give us the rundown, can I ask somebody to pray for our meal? Norma, would you bless our meal, even though, and everybody else who is also bringing the meal to Zoom? What are you eating, Norma? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, because I, I messed up something on my, I never understand what I'm doing here, but I guess I, I had had it muted, me muted, I guess. Sure, I'm having a um, Hershey's chocolate nugget with caramel Ooh, so that's wow. my snack i didn't bring any of them <laughs> would you, norma would you bless all our meals i, I will thank I'll you i'll try to do that god please bless uh, all of us as we are about to partake of something that will renew us for our second part of our discussion we are so glad we are together today Bless us all. Amen. 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 The most important part, make it there, first. Did you say someone yes. in this family? There was a story I heard one our, time. Our daughter was going about to be the director okay. of the Carolina a Church Rams. in Africa that no. was completely Very open. Weird. It was outdoors. It was under the pavilion, open walls. Through next to the the next week is one of and the presidents of the While uh, church was going on, there was a fisherman at the well, right here. She applied for it. And, and so when it got to the time there. of the autumn, so the pastor looked so over here. Here comes the fisherman walking up the bay with this huge fish. And he wow. lays it on the altar as an offer. The pastor said, good sir, you must have had side of an me. incredible catch to bring this fit up closer to the altar. Fisherman responds, no, this is my first. I'm not talking now about I will go <laughs> And then what's her question? It's beautiful. It's not a The right attitude. But he works from home. Most of the time. So he's your home right at home. When he eventually moved to South Carolina, or North Carolina, he did not buy a house there. Yeah. Yeah. And he'll. Like, yes, they'll be halfway between us, us and Eric. <laughs> Our son's a good stop off on his Yeah, yeah. Y'all have not, I've seen your house. Yes. You've done well for He starts there on the 6th or the 7th of September. So. He's got a busy couple of weeks coming up. I remember, I remember. It was somebody, well, was it somebody in there. the church? Yeah. 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 Oh, right. Oh, I saw, uh, I saw Jerry. Okay. Okay. I did go well, on yesterday. Well, well, I went over today. And and gave me a piece of cake. Oh, <laughs> hey, buddy, enjoy. Yeah. He tried to get me more. He tried to get me an ice cream. Jerry, I'm This is at someone yesterday. Well, I was supposed to yeah, say that's a little further away. Yeah. 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 That's what he said. You said you cut him tomatoes. She ate. So, okay. Yeah, I'm struggling with the groundhog. All right, Rebecca, are we ready? All right, folks.
As far as so, as far as Then this the whole palace of the I don't know why. I mean, you could have moved in a the well there was there was a bed. there was a few pieces one one that is one a marriage yeah. place yeah. between King and King. I to be means that a fourth of Which would be to go down. Status. 
that was that point when their security that were minutes ago. I'm surprised that uh, Andy and uh, that they they had some little commitment or something. I think uh, was it the cinema? Yeah. 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 There was probably 25 or 30 coaches on there. That I mean, it says it was up to 900 people. I mean, the station was full of people. So, yeah, we got in the pairs. I mean, yeah, and that evening, I, I'll close it when you read. Remind me when you're ready. Oh, 20 minutes walk south of the center town. You can see the other side. We walked up there and we thought, well, we get in line. So we decided to leave there and go to a restaurant. As we were celebrating, we had one book in our Bible, and we got out on the sidewalk. And I felt Matthew dropped the name and hit my shoulder. I've been reading it. Uh oh, here it comes. I have never seen rain. Oh, this rainstorm was so bad it made the world mission go. You couldn't see. Yeah, it was raining so hard. We were as wet as if we had stood in the shower. No, been thrown in a swimming pool. We didn't. There wasn't any shelter. No time. You couldn't you take shelter. Time you walk from here to where Chris is at. The parish buildings are all flat fronted. Everything. You're singing in the rain. 
Next time. I got that. We didn't get in the loop. The only way you can do this city is just take a week, go over there. I would think we can at least a whole month to see everything in there. Oh, but we went to the Museum of Art, which is the Railroad Museum. Saw Whistler's mother. Never really. All the most popular Van Gogh's starring right. You should um, um Monet's. Oh, yeah, what was beautiful? The sculpture from the winter. I took no, a picture of one sculpture. No, tell, tell Mary about it because, like, four years ago, we did a, a theology kind of study. In one part of that, we all studied different world religions, and Mary studied um, Sikhism. We did make it the Sikh world, Sikhism. The Sikh, with the. And, uh, Order yeah, it. Yeah. Well, now, now I need to go to a baptism. She's a certified and one and you just see we're Oh yeah. But uh that is fabulous. Oh, what a great you would think that was me. Well, here's why. Well, <laughs> Transferred on the on that, so they can use like all you want to get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just fruit fill thing, water. Yeah, water yeah, cream. Water cream. And jelly. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it was four. I don't know. 16, I'm sitting out on the farm on them. Good steps. But the cheese is in translate well in the onions. Good bike in the yes. They don't eat cheese on top of them. Not where we have. I graduated high school. No, I graduated in college. Well, at the hotel, terrible. Yes. Their breakfast was in eggs. But the scrambled eggs were terrible. There you go. <laughs> and they fruit and yogurt. Oh, the pork and beans is what it is, not baked. Beans. They call them, they call them pork and baked beans, but they're sitting they like pork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lot. That's a European thing. Hey, in Israel, it's hummus every day. Every day. There's our girl with one of the little birds that's Castro. Uh, yeah. 
the Peregrine Fund in Boise, Idaho, but she's moving to the executive director of the Carolina Raptor Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. You call it Steve Hart. Who? Steve Hart. No, not his blog. I just see his Facebook. He's a manager. Yeah. You know what my daughter would say to that? Survival of the fittest. Folks, I know we're uh, still eating and, and everything, but um, as we grab our plates, we, we can continue to eat, but I'd like to call us back together. I don't want to get too far behind, although I've been informed that um, there may be one chapter that we spend quite a lot of time on later on. Um, so as we come come back together, we we were talking about the cross and why it is so scandalous. Um, in in fact, the Greek word that um, that Paul uses to call when he talks about the crucifixion um, as a stumbling block, the Greek word is scandalon, from which we get our English word scandalous. The cross is a scandal. And um, why? Why? Why is the cross a scandal? God's not supposed to be weak. If you know the word excruciating also comes from crucifixion. Mm. 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 God, God's not supposed to be weak. Yeah, I do, but let's read. Also, from the dead. We're in. We're still in chapter one. Um, verse. Let's let's read verse 18 to the end of chapter one, verse 18 to well, 31. Before we do that, I think we have to look at 17 sure. for a moment. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, that the cross of Christ did not be made void. Mm -hmm. And and I think Jesus way back said. You have to have the faith of a child. Hmm. And I think it, it, it's Paul saying that you don't have to flower up the speech to hmm. preach the gospel, what the message is. Hmm. And um, <clears throat> I don't know. I think that's an important verse. You, you don't want to complicate it to the point that you lose sight about what it's all about. And I think sometimes we have a tendency to complicate stuff. And then you really say, well, you know, if you don't read this version of the Bible, you're not reading the right stuff. Or if you don't do it this way, you're not. If you don't follow these different procedures in, in the church or in the worship service, and then mm -hmm. sometimes we get too hung up on all that other stuff and you lose sight of what it's about. Mm -hmm. Well, we oh. think his love has nothing to do with any suffering. I mean, if we if we ignore the cross, which Paul didn't want it ignored, <laughs> we look at love like a Hallmark love, a Hallmark mm -hmm. movie love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not where anybody has to make a sacrifice of any kind, and especially God making a sacrifice. That was unknown with any other religions that they knew of, any pagan religions. 
God, the God wasn't going to make a sacrifice in any of those. So this was kind of brand new to everybody. I want to hold that thought and come back to the beginning of chapter two. Okay. Because, and you'll see, you'll see why. Um, but somebody read uh, verses 18 through 31 for us. The message about the execution of the state was nonsense to those in the process of being destroyed. But to us in the process of being saved, this is the power of God. Indeed, it cannot. The Old Testament says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and frustrate the intelligence of the intelligent. I might say it. I like the way I like the way Paul reads the Old Testament because he is preaching. He doesn't have the New Testament yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he really does not need a philosopher, the poor teacher, or any of today's thinkers. I think God made this world for pretty old. He said the world's wisdom was pretty foolish. For God, God's wisdom will gain that the world needed his own wisdom and not come to know him. Remember, God decided to use the nonsense of what we proclaim as his means of saving those who come to trust him. Precisely because the Jews asked for signs and the Greeks tried to find wisdom, we go on proclaiming a Messiah executed on the stake as a criminal. To Jews, this is an obstacle. And to Greeks, it is nonsense. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, and Messiah is God's power and God's wisdom. For God's nonsense is wiser than humanity's wisdom. That is far from close to right. Um, <laughs> somebody else pick up and read to verse 31. We're in on verse 26 to 31. For you see your calling, brother, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised have God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ, Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorifies, let him glory in the Lord. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Donna. So yes, why why is the message of the cross foolishness to those outside the church? And do you think this is still true today? Yeah. More so. More so. There's less believers today than there were 10 years ago, I think. Do you think the message of the cross, though, is still foolishness? them do you think the reason they are not believers is because the message of the cross is foolishness i don't think so i don't think so i just think that they're not believers because they just it's too much of a takes too much effort hmm. to, to be a christian because they have to give up some things that they think are important to them that really aren't um they have to give up playing soccer on sunday or doing whatever they you know but they, <laughs> but part of that is i mean people don't do things with the church and whatever because everything else is taken precedent over that mm -hmm. and church is by the wayside it's mm. not it's not an important part of it's not an important part of family in a lot of families mm. You know, he talks about idolatry in here. Idolatry is, is making anything else more important than God. Like soccer, right. sports, right. sports, football, right. like money, like status and power, anything more important than God. Doesn't Paul talk about dying to self? 
Mm -hmm. I read something by a guy who was a Buddhist. His name was Ajahn Sun, who was also very well versed in Christianity too. And he made a comment that you know, and I know this is not anyway. What he said was, even if Jesus hadn't died on the cross and been crucified, if you just look at what he said, the gospel that was revealed to all of us, and the gospel said. It's all there. Everything about love God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, whole strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. You just look at that. And the message that he gave about it as, you know, as he denounced worldly goods. And if you just read what he said, just his words alone to me, um, I, I don't know, for me personally, I don't know that I need um, to keep only focusing on the cross. And I'm not saying you shouldn't focus on the cross. But I'm saying, for me, there's enough there, There's enough in the Bible and just what the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John said for me to be a, to convince me about the truth of what, what where Jesus was at and why he was, why he was such a holy man. And for, for Paul, when he says cross, um, He's using that as um, in the same way that we might say, oh, I got a new set of wheels last week. Well, you know, I don't mean I've just got four wheels, right? I, you, mean, you know, I mean, I got the whole car, right? So for, for Paul to use the word cross, he's referring to the entirety, the, 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 the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Oh, yeah. The one thing that stands, <clears throat> the one thing that stands out for me, is the fact that from the Old Testament to this point, if you were to look at the five major blood offerings that were made, revealed a shadow to the cross, each and every one of them, starting uh, first and foremost. Um, with uh, Genesis 3.15, where Genesis 3.15 reveals after the fall of Adam and Eve, after they had eaten the fruit, God revealed a message. And that message was that Satan had would be bruised and Christ heal would be bruised. To some extent, which was the beginning of the message. And then it went on when Adam and Eve uh, were hiding from God and um, were ashamed of their nakedness. It was God that clothed them with garments of skin, which in Isaiah it is proclaimed clothed. Uh, cover the garment of righteousness, clothed with the garment of salvation, covered with the robe of righteousness. That, from that point on, you see a journey starting with um, Jacob and Abraham on Mount Moriah, where the knife is about ready to be plunged into his son. Mm -hmm. And God says, Stop, look in the thicket and you will find a sacrifice of ram crowned with thorns. There was a second sacrifice. Then the third sacrifice when God drew the nation of Israel out of Egypt. There are three very specific truths. And that truth was, first of all, he sent a man, a person in the name of Moses, he revealed the blood of a lamb and the, uh, with the Passover of the death angel and placed the blood on the lentil and the doorpost. And if you look at it, it gets the image of a cross right there. Mm -hmm. The lentil and the doorpost, the left, right, and the doorpost. And then he takes those people, journeys them out of Egypt. And when 
the soldiers and Pharaoh are ready to pounce on them. Moses says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And he takes his uh, yeah, staff. staff. And there he reveals the power, the person, <laughs> the blood, and the power <coughs> is a shadow of Christ. <laughs> but it's not only. The next step is the tabernacle. <laughs> And the blood of the lamb sacrificed on the day of atonement. And then comes the cross. And so he prepared the nation of Israel to understand this. And I heard you quote in Isaiah uh, about the crucifixion. He was wounded for our transgressions. Covered that whole thing was revealed by Isaiah, and yet the nation of Israel ignored it all when he hung on the cross, the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world. You would have thought this is the sacrifice we've been waiting for mm -hmm. when we went to the well, in the tabernacle. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. <clears throat> When Jesus came to him, who will take away the sins of the world, mm -hmm. the atonement. And the, the high priest would go in every year with the atonement for the sins of Israel. He tied a rope on the guy in case they could pull him out of there if God struck him dead, you know. <laughs> and and uh, it's interesting when, when Christ was crucified, the, the veil to it was ripped from the top to bottom. Mm -hmm. And that was like, yeah. <clears throat> well, the Read the Old Testament. Every from Genesis, as you mentioned, Leviticus. I mean, it was so many told me you had to read Leviticus. Somebody gets a minister to come to my conference. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's marvelous if you have a good teacher and it, it opens mm -hmm. up. Hebrews, it opens up a whole sacrificial system and how Christ fulfilled it all. I mean, he just, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I just am so excited that when I read that, it just opened my mind. I think plans God had from the very beginning for us. And to think Paul didn't get it either. Paul didn't get it no. before right. his, yeah. until. Christ entered his life, you know, on the road to Damascus. I mean, he just, he didn't get it. And he was a scholarly man taught by Gamaliel and he knew it all. And then suddenly a light had to come on to the, all the, the, the words of the, the law and the prophets. Suddenly it was like, oh, now I see it. If we don't see Christ as as who he was, our sacrificial lamb, it's all for nothing. I think you have to understand, I think, the people of the time that they were looking for a Messiah that was going to save Israel. Yeah. They were looking for a warrior king to come in and run the Romans out of town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And I think you have to consider the fact that, that it was Passover. So all the young people in Israel were up in Jerusalem for the Passover. And the only ones left at home were the old or the young. And so all the young people were in Jerusalem for Passover. And Caiaphas and all these others, they're looking and they're saying, this young man has got such a following going on. And then there's other people like the Barabbas group, um, the zealots um, that are always looking for a way to overthrow Rome. And they're saying, if we don't do something and, and stop what's going on here, we're afraid that if there is a rebellion Rome could bring in legions of soldiers and essentially our population could be wiped out. Mm -hmm. and, and, and 
And besides the fact it's bad for business too, <laughs> uh, because you know, he threw all the money changers and so forth out of the church or out of the synagogue. And, and I think you have to keep that stuff in mind and, and they missed the point um, that the, and, and the prophets in those days and the, the old prophets could only see it at distance. Uh, it's like going across Kansas and on, on the horizon, you see the Rocky Mountains. But you can't see what all's behind the Rocky Mountain. And I think those prophets saw from a distance things that were happening, but they couldn't see the layers. It's, it's like in Isaiah when he says, um, I proclaim the year of the Lord and so forth. And also, I bring the wrath of God. And Isaiah couldn't see that part. He couldn't see all the layers behind it. And and um, I think there's a lot of things you have to take in. And what would we have done yeah. in, those, in the same days and the same thing? Um, well, so we're talking about wisdom. We're talking about wisdom here in the in these verses. Wisdom, right? And and Paul is saying uh, not not wisdom, but foolishness, right? And so the wisdom, the wisdom of the day, the wisdom was. Caiaphas, the leaders, they're looking down. They're saying, this is going to wipe us out. This is going to take away our position and our power. The wisdom of the day. Do you hear me? The wisdom of the day. This is where we are. The wisdom of the day. Is and it any different today? Is it any different today? No. <laughs> is it any different today? It's politics. Mm -hmm. It's politics. Then. It's buying buying for status and power. And so the thing is, is the wisdom um, in, the, in the reason he talks about eloquent speech and wisdom is that in, in that day, one of the ways that you showed your status was by speaking eloquently, persuasively, and showing off that you were wise. And it wasn't to enrich and it wasn't to teach it was to increase your status among those that would listen to you. And Satan is very good at it. Mm -hmm. and Paul would speak for hours. <laughs> and so that's why, but that's why Paul says, I didn't come with eloquent wisdom. Mm -hmm. I only came to proclaim the gospel. And that's why in, in just a few minutes, when we get to chapter two, he's going to say, I didn't come with lofty words of wisdom. Just the gospel. Just the gospel. You know, but he's going to say there is wisdom. There is wisdom. And that is, but it's not for you yet. Right? It's not, or you have to be mature for it. And it's the wisdom that comes through the spirit of God, the spirit of power that comes from God. And it's not human wisdom because human wisdom is selfishness. How can I increase myself, my family, my people, my country at the expense of everyone else? And that is not why Jesus came, right? I I try not to preach in this class, but <laughs> um, but that that's that's exactly where you're coming from, Bill. Is that to me? It's ironic that um, the the whole uh, our whole uh, whole education system thing that we do is to make us more productive, make us a better citizen, help us to get a better job, help you to get successful, to get ahead, all that stuff, which runs exactly 100 degrees opposite of what Jesus is talking about. And I, I think it's almost like uh, when you talk about maturity, I, I really think that's uh, a big part of it because, um, you know, you need to go through all of the ways of being out for yourself to realize that being out for yourself is not where you really want to be. It's not really what Jesus is asking you to do, you know, and I think, I think you need to go through that. That's to me what it's all about the Holy Spirit. But you have to have that, that knowledge that comes inside of you that lets you know what, you know, what, what you're supposed to do 
it tells you you hear it's like intuition mm. um for me it is anyway so without the spirit is it pollution sure. yeah absolutely because why would i make myself <clears throat> lower why yeah. would i why would you give all your money away give it away yeah. why without without the knowledge not the knowledge of the spirit and the wisdom that comes from god and the knowledge that that is true wisdom why why it's foolishness it's foolishness why carry the cross why should i carry my own cross what good is that going to do for me it's foolishness if you don't have the knowledge that comes from the spirit, the wisdom that comes from the spirit. Right. Yeah. Unless you realize that someone else are very connected in a deep way. If you don't realize that, then you know that's yeah. In Jeremiah yourself. In in the ninth chapter of Jeremiah, uh, 23 and 24, <clears throat> thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, mm -hmm. and let not a mighty man boast boast of his might let not a rich man boast of his riches but let him who boasts boast of this that he understands and knows me that i am the lord who exercise loving kindness justice and righteousness on earth mm -hmm. for i delight in these things declares the lord mm -hmm. and that's what paul's paraphrasing in verse 31 here mm -hmm. And that's what it comes down to, right? This is why. So there shall be no boasting. I think, Karen, when you read the the word was glory, like glory, yeah. glory in the Lord. Yeah. yeah. And and so let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Not not of your own account, or not of your own deeds, or not, uh, you know, pride. Not what what you do but only because of what God has done through me. Yeah. And, and also let, let not anyone judge mm -hmm. because we're all guilty. We're all, we've all been sinners. We're all sinners. I see that a lot. Of, uh, that's to me is what we're talking about. You know, you, you know, as you go through your life, you're judgmental. You're judging everything. You're judging other people. And, you know, you're walking down the street, you're looking ahead to see who that person up there. Are they going to, Oh, an iPhone. You know, I mean, you're, you're thinking all your thinking ahead and not taking care of yourself. You're being judgmental. And then Jesus says, "Don't be judgmental. Be non-judgmental. Accept hate, love, forgive." And it's just um, hard to do. A lot. If you don't have the Holy, if you don't have something, the rock, you know, Jesus, whatever. You're you're going to be lost. Well, let me let me read um, real quick, chapter two. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaim. Also, want you to know that Adelphoi, brothers and sisters, is used 38 times throughout the book of 1 Corinthians. That's more than twice as much as Paul uses that phrase in any of his other letters. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, reminding them this is who we are. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. And yet among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. 
And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's Spirit, for they are foolishness to them, and they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those who are spiritual discern all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So Paul, Paul really understands that if you are a part of the believing community, you have the spirit within you. The spirit is the, the, a gift from God that is almost like a, the, the first fruits. Um, it's, um, he says, the commentator says, it's like a down payment on our future glory. <laughs> The spirit, um, and um, I, I, I don't know. Do you think often about being Holy Spirit inspired? Uh, do you, do you consider the spirit within you? This is the spirit is something outside human understanding. Maybe that sounds too clinical to say it's a medical. Mm -hmm. It is a spirit, unless you have spirit, you don't understand. It is something outside what we know and we touch and feel. I think it would be really hard for God to, uh, or for Paul, to have been able to uh, to explain this to people. Mm -hmm. Not because he said, well, you know, he gave everybody the Holy Spirit. That's, it sounds great, but I mean, it's it's pretty hard. To, it's pretty complicated to me. It's not like you know, to, to enlist people in this, in a religion. Um, they had to feel that. They had to feel the Spirit of God. And uh, so I think it's, I, I understand why it was such a hard time getting, the, getting everything off the ground because you've got to, people have to realize what, what he's what the message is he's given and it's not that easy to pick up on it when you're used to this is what he says is foolish and stupid it's what now we're telling everybody that that's what is accurate so it's it's very conflictual to me and i can understand why people got really confused as to what he was saying got into arguments about it but he's not talking here he's talking to believe yeah you know so but, but this is not how he would have thought. But I mean, it's a handful of believers. It's not a huge number of people. So to get more people to come to the church, yeah. The audience. If he, was, if he was standing on a thing trying to convert Jews or Gentiles, yeah. I don't think he'd be talking. Okay. I don't know. No, I, I, no, I think it's probably accurate. I think about the apostles of. After Jesus was uh, crucified, uh, after he had left them, he was with them <clears throat> 40 days, and he left them, sent them into heaven to his father. They were alone for 10 days, and they were without the spirit. What yeah. did they do? Mm -hmm. mm. Going back to their old lives. Mm -hmm. Without the spirit. To me, that's earth shattering. So Pentecost, you know, mm -hmm. that... Regenerized that brought the spirit in and uh, their lives started. But it was 10 days, let's say. <clears throat> there was a void. Yeah. Wasn't Pentecost also happening at the time of the Holy Spirit when there was a Jewish also? It was 50 days after the Passover. Passover. I think I think so I, I'd have to go back and look in Acts I'm pretty sure it, it will say uh, was it the Feast of Booths at that time is that what it is I think it was yeah um, they went back to Christian didn't they Um, I think it may have been. Well, they, they went back to their 
<clears throat> boats because yeah. Christ met him at the Sea of Galilee and was fixing breakfast right. on the shore. Yep, he had fish cooking for him. Yeah. Yep. We went to that supposedly the rock where all that took place. Did you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the Sea of Galilee. So, so he says that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm paying attention to the time. So he says that uh, he, when he was first with them, he only spoke the gospel, right? Like we were saying earlier, no words of wisdom, no eloquent speech, nothing. He even says, "I came in much weakness and fear and trembling." trembling yeah, yeah. So he didn't come with flashy bravado and and flashy words and all the that that the, that they would think of this is the this is the guy you know this is some guy we got to listen to him and he's he's saying no when i came to you you know i wasn't very good at speaking um even though he was um professionally trained <laughs> a rhetorician uh but yeah yeah he's very good at writing apparently paul i don't know he he got some stage fright or something i don't know um or so he says mm -hmm. well even even there's a place where it said he wrote something really big mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. No, and that probably was the thorn that he kept asking God to remove, yeah, if you will, right. please. I understand if you can't, but this affliction is not fun, and it probably was at sight. And he says, my grace is sufficient. Right, so, right. So, Dr. Luke, so, right. Well, but even, he, even he gave, Moses was uh, afraid, to, you know, afraid to speak. Yeah. yeah. So, so he's saying, well, you know, even and, and this should give uh, everyone uh, confidence uh, when you are called on to come and lead worship and read scripture and maybe even provide a testimony sometime, um, that uh, it's not about how you deliver the message. It's the content of the message. And the content of the message here was simply the gospel, because these were people who had never heard it before mm -hmm. and they needed to and then he, now he says now when we get to being mature in the faith we do have wisdom that comes from the spirit that we impart um but next week there's plot twist <laughs> next week, because the very next verse next in chapter week, three I have to with milk. that's I right not quite because there is the vision <laughs> Right. Yeah. Right. He's talking to the Corinthians all, oh, mature Christians, we can speak of wisdom. And if you're a spiritual person, you understand. And 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 these are these are people who didn't read. So they they probably got a reader reading the letter and they're all sitting there listening and hearing for the first time. And oh, oh, we're, we're gonna get some some spiritual wisdom now that we're all mature and and everything. And then he gets to chapter three and 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 he says. I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. <laughs> so we're not quite there yet, but here's a picture of where you could be, of where you could be as mature Christians. So, so when do you become a mature Christian? Oh, that's a good question. The work in progress. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I do feel the inner workings of the spirit. Um, and so maybe you feel that too. And, and maybe um, it's, it's, it's always one of those things where, where you've never arrived. Like you said, Bill, I mean, we're not fully sanctified until glory. And so we're always being, or David said, one of them said, yeah, being, David said. being sanctified, where it's, so it's a process. It's a process of maturing, but I think we do get to a point where we've internalized the gospel, but there are more things we can we can always continue diving deeper into God. There's one truth that I that I do know, mm -hmm. and that uh, was from the lips of the Lord when He said, 
where there are two or three of my name, <clears throat> I'm in the midst of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe that the Holy Spirit is right here mm -hmm. among us because the Lord sent him. Amen. Amen. He's faithful. That's a good place yes. to stop. That's a good place to stop. Um, are there prayer concerns to share tonight? We want to keep praying for Jerry and Jim, of course. Um, what was that? The thing you did. I don't know what Jerry. Yeah. Uh, Rob Wolf, of course, lost Karen, and that's nothing more difficult or harder on a person than losing to a spouse at such a young age. And she had such a fabulously vibrant life of loving God and following his ways. Playing with food. And she, um, of course, passed on, and he's on Facebook with me, and he's, he's tapping through things. And just think about Rob and the boys. Mm -hmm. In your thoughts and prayers, they they need God and and surround them with good thoughts and positive feelings, and and hopefully they'll gain strength through other people's love. That would be very helpful. Jason and Seth. <clears throat> Chris, I have a couple of prayer requests. Uh, okay. One would be for as we pray for AJ and Susan, who entered your life and allowed you to progress the way you have. And we're so fortunate to have you here at Northwest Church, Chris. And also to Babs, who is now on Zoom with us. I think this is the first time she has been on Zoom uh, <laughs> for Bible study since she lost her husband a while ago, so. Thank you. Just keep both of those groups in their prayers. Certainly. Uh, Kathy. Yeah, um, our next door neighbor was taken by car yesterday to a nursing home. And I just saw her right before we came over here. And she said to me, I'll never go home again. Oh. So I knew one. It broke my heart to do it. She's struggling. Mm -hmm. It's hard. What's her name? Chris? Yes, uh, Mark. I don't know if it's just me, but I'm having a hard time hearing prayer requests. Okay. Um, Completely. Uh, Kathy's uh, next door neighbor, Lucille, 91, was, was taken by a squad to a nursing home and, and um, does not believe she'll ever get to go home again. And so we're going to pray for the seal. Chris. Yes. Uh, Howard and Dean. Yes. Ron Kimberly's service is going to be at Sheddinger Northwest, that's on Zollinger Road at 10.30 a.m. on Tuesday, next Tuesday, a week from today on the 30th. Uh, calling hours are Monday before, Monday night, I believe from 4 to 7 p.m., but you can, at, at Shenningers, but you can go online and look up the obituary and the information's there. It's at Shenninger Northwest on Zollinger Road. And Butts, uh, may never go home again. I uh, Anna's um yes she might be moving to South Carolina. Yes, we we've, we've oh, been Anna? with her, spent some time. Roger yeah. and I spent time with Ann Buzz last Sunday, last Sunday evening, a week ago. Just had a delightful time with her and um he's managing to continue to get healthier. Mm -hmm. She is considering, or she's been told that the plan is to have her move to South Carolina where one of her granddaughters lives and she will be her uh, support person but she'll be in a assisted living setting i don't know how soon she'll get to leave over here at mill run but she i think feeling a little uncertain about it and my great hope is that she's still here for her 100th birthday on the 15th of october 
and and she said that if she's still here um here in ohio um she would love to be able to come to church on the 16th on that Sunday for her 100th birthday. Oh, so great. I told her that if that happens, if she's here, I will make it happen. I'm going to I'm going to count on somebody to well, I told her there would be her. a party, so I'll be right there and we'll her. and we'll throw her a, a party here. Amen. So, That's the 100th it. birthday. So if I were her <laughs> any other prayer uh, and and Anna. Anna bus oh yes she's she's healing and things she's moving around more now that's good they've got her up doing rehab so that's good she's had like three hip replacements oh, this was the fourth episode with her leg hip area yeah, so, I, you know, pretty bad stuff she's tough oh um, no. I think we had to pray for the people of Europe, mm -hmm. Great Britain. We were over there, and they are going through a drought and mm -hmm. a heat wave. I mean, stuff is just burnt up, and yeah, and rivers are possible. going down. And uh, also, the people in China, the Yangtze River is way down. They have something like eight hydroelectric dams along that river, which about 80% of their electricity comes from those things. And they're having to shut down factories and businesses because they don't have the electricity mm. to run them, which is going to make a uh, already dismal economy over there worse. And even though they're not our friends, or so to speak, but still, I mean, People are going through some hard times with yes, this stuff, are. and I, and I I'm just I was important. shocked when we saw Britain. You know, usually London and, and England, you think it's all rainy and so yeah. forth. It just they've is, gone three months without rain. Grass, grass, so burn up. I mean, it'll just never come back. Yeah, just it was all perennials burn up. Yeah. Thank God. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And all the people that, that you know, I think they just found the second person in Texas that died because of the flooding. The yeah. flooding we need to yeah. all clear. And the yeah. flooding on I mean, just... the whole the whole southwest is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now the Arizona. Yep. All of yep. mm -hmm. Yeah. And other parts of the world it just mm -hmm. the Danube is so low that it's Serbia. They've they can see under the Water, twenty Nazi ships. Yep. 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 I read about oh, yeah. With all their ammo and everything. Yeah, oh, all this ordnance in there that's been laying there for 75, 80 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the war. Other prayer concerns. <clears throat> Chris. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I visited my cousin today, and he's uh, in a nursing home. He's got uh, trouble with his legs. He can't walk. So I would appreciate prayers for him. What's his name? Jack. Jack Rao. <clears throat> Others? Ukraine. Ukraine, yes, yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Peace all over the world. Um, Owen tested positive for COVID. Oh, oh. He's fine. He's had all his shots and he's only got a runny nose. So that's good. But he's very disappointed that he has to stay home from school. Oh. Mm. Oh, Second grade. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. So his dad is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm disappointed because I don't get to see him this week because he's staying with his mom because that's ground zero. Mm -hmm. They all have COVID. Mm -hmm. and I prefer not to have it in my house with yeah. my parents coming this weekend. On top of everything else, we don't want Sydney to get it either. So. 
they probably picked it up from school the first day because That's what it was their first day back. So yeah. It's everywhere. But oh, yeah. the good news is it's it's getting milder and milder and oh, it's slowly turning into another common cold. So it's that's the good news. So hopefully we get there soon. Okay, let's pray. Good and gracious God, we give you great thanks for this time to gather together for uh, all of the ways that you have brought us closer tonight, God, that uh, the ways that you have taught us and, and brought us closer to you as well and enriched our lives together in our faith. We are mindful of the many concerns that have been shared here tonight. Lord, we lift up to you by name, our brother and sister, Jerry and Judy. Uh, we lift up the Walzak family. Um, we lift up Sister Babs, um, and we thank you for her presence with us tonight. Um, we lift up Lucille. We lift up the family of Ron Kimberly. We lift up Anna Bus. We lift up Jack and pray that he would have healing in his legs. We pray for all of those around our world who are suffering from drought and heat waves, from flooding, from war and violence. And uh, I also ask special prayers for for Owen um, and for his mom and, and her family as they recover from COVID. I ask your blessing on each one here tonight as we exit this place, either virtually or physically, um, that you would guard and protect us until we come together again next week, that you would uh, lead us along righteous paths for your name's sake, that you would increase our love for one another, for our neighbors, and most especially God for you. And um, we give you thanks for all that you have given to us and the many blessings we share. And we lift all of these prayers up to you now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. See you next week. Have a good week. And uh, Bill and Carol will be bringing our treat next week. Good.